Okay, get off your phone. I was Googling something. Let's make sure that we like get some people joining in. Oh, there, look. I'm old. Stop. Stop Googling. Hi. <laughs> hey, everybody. We're just going to chit chat a little bit while a few more people join in. Um, welcome to our pest management workshop. I am. There's a ladybug on the table. Okay. I'm <laughs> Tiffany. This is Chris. Um, I am one half of Little River Cooperative, and Chris is the whole piece of French Farms. We are both small scale farmers based in South Florida, and we are on the Little River property today um, by ourselves. It's closed to the public. We won't be interacting with the public at all. And also, we are partners, so we live together. So I wanted to just say that to explain why we're sitting very close together and not wearing masks. We are being safe. We are not wearing masks because we live together. Um, we really wanted to do a pest management workshop because A, I said we would talk about pests in the last workshop and we didn't at all because there was so much other stuff to talk about. But also, um, pest questions are maybe most of the questions that we get from uh, followers and in our text messages from people who buy plants from us. It seems to be a struggle that people feel is they cannot handle on their own. How do I keep the bugs off my plants? Or what is this bug? Help me. How do I deal with it? And so we wanted to make a resource that we could share with you guys and then share online for maybe forever or something that people can watch because we, how do I say this nicely, are sick of getting the text. Pest identification is really easy. Sometimes. There's a lot of information out there and so we want to empower you guys to properly identify and talk about your pests and use the internet properly as a resource tool for yourself, like a research tool. And we want to talk about some pest management concepts that we think are really important on like a farm scale and also in the home garden. Um, okay, so I guess we should start by kind of talking about like even just the concept of the garden pest. A pest is basically, it's like a weed. Okay, like what is a weed? It's a plant that you don't want there. It's a plant that you are competing with space and resources for. Um, there's no like definitive like that is a weed. You know what I mean? Like it's not a category of plant. It's like a perspective on a plant. It's a subjective category. So pests are the same way. A pest is like a bug that wants the same thing you want, which is your plant, and <laughs> you're competing with it. And so that's why you think it's a pest. But really, they're all bugs. Like I guess I'm saying this because people do things like they'll um, like plant certain plants just so the butterfly larva can eat them but then like they'll go and kill like all the moth larva that are eating their bok choy so we kind of want you guys to think about that as a basis for your whole pest journey yeah. you know like some people choose to not treat pests to Both share their space. I was going to say, talk about those like butterflies that always eat everyone's passion fruit. Right, yeah. yeah. Passion fruit is a great example of um, a Both or whatever. <laughs> of a bug that people have a hard time deciding how to manage because they want, they don't want to kill the butterfly, but they also don't want the butterfly to kill their passion fruit vine. You know, so there's like that plays into like your whole pest management um, journey 
you know, is like, how many bugs do you want to kill? How do you want to decide which bugs are destined to be murdered in for the sake of your garden and which pests you want to keep around or you want to encourage, or I mean bugs, you know? So I just want to kind of like have that as something yeah, that people think about. Yeah, there's a lot of philosophy, about. like, you know, along pest control, I think. Maybe, yeah. maybe you shouldn't have had the plant in there. You know, maybe the plant, we can kind of talk about that a little bit because, you know, a lot of these plants are on their way out. If you have a winter garden, mm -hmm. you know, the pests have completely ramped up and you're right at the same time as your plant's health is decreasing just because, you know, it already made its tomatoes or made its eggplant and it's kind of on its way out. And so, like, it's, it's letting itself get attacked by bugs. Maybe yeah, talk of, about, I know you really want to be the person to talk about Okay, so also, before I before we move on, a pest isn't just an insect also. We want you guys to, I just want to say this so that you think about it while you're looking at your plant and thinking, what's wrong with my plant? So a pest can be like an insect, um, an insect you can see or an insect you can't see because they're microscopic ones. It can also be a soil-borne microscopic insect. Like a perfect example for that is a nematode, which is we're gonna talk about later. It's not an insect, okay? It's like a, <laughs> it's a ringworm. I mean, the science police over here. Okay. Sure. And then uh, funguses and viruses and bacteria are all also pests, you know, things that you're gonna battle with over the health of your plant. So, um, yeah, like when we say pest, we don't mean like only bug, we mean like all the things mixed together. But I know Chris really wants to like drive it home how like the main okay so people ask us like how do I deter pests like I think we get a question a lot about like give me a product that I can you know spray on my plants to make it so that I never have pests silver bullet. like a preventative silver bullet and Chris has the answer for a preventative silver bullet we're gonna listen to him right now talk about it yeah we're, we're gonna bring it up about. again oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, you gotta have really healthy plants. I mean, your healthy plants just won't get attacked. Or they'll get attacked a lot less, or they'll get attacked and they'll grow through it. And there's some really fascinating science, new science kind of coming out about that as we sort of discover more about um, the way soil works and the way plants work with soil. And um, there's actually, you know, the actual enzymes within plants can change depending on how healthy the plant is and make themselves more desirable to certain pests. So, some really healthy plants will not even be digestible to a lot of insects. And, or visible, right? There's like science out there. That oh yeah, can... yeah, yeah. Locusts can see like a distressed field from afar with their really complex eyes and they can, they can come down there and they can see the UV light coming back from the plants and determine that the plants are unhealthy and easily digested by the, uh, by the insects. So anyway, that's plants are healthy. Okay, and why wouldn't your plants be um, potentially as healthy as possible this time of year? Uh, well, maybe it's too hot. Maybe they're already done because they're annuals and you planted them back in the winter and they've kind of done their thing. Um, maybe you just stopped watering them. Maybe their leaf temperature got above 86 degrees. That's very possible. Maybe uh, it rained and bacteria spores came down in the rain and landed all over your cucurbits. And so it could be a whole lot of things. But in general... In general. Um, your annuals that are like finishing in your garden are under a particular amount more stress this time of year and it's making them more susceptible to pest damage and you can couple that with the fact that it's more humid and it's hotter now which means that the pests are going to reproduce faster so there are more of them. Their populations balloon in the summer. And something that is like not great for us, but we have to deal with is like in the north where it freezes. Uh, in the off season, a lot of the pests and their eggs and their whatever will um, freeze and that will kill off their populations. But here it's the opposite. The pests will proliferate in the summer and then we go right into our fall gardening season with like the absolute yeah. maximal amount of pests possible. Yeah, so the shoulder seasons where we're actually trying to do most of the work, we're either harvesting or planting, 
they, they get hotter here in South Florida versus versus like up north where they're getting cooler. And so we're, we're trying to put a bunch of plants in right as the pests are kind of at their max reproduction cycle, I mean. Right. So, so the more heat and more energy the plants have, uh, the insects have, the faster they can go through their little cycle and the more vigilant you need to be. So. Yeah. Okay. But we'll get more into that. Okay, so then we're going to define a term for you that is like a popular organic... So it's just catch-all. It's a kind of a catch-all. Whether you're organic or conventional, just it's like common sense kind of in a way. So it's called integrated pest management. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this if you've ever spent any time sort of seriously Googling plant pest control. A lot of the extension offices will, will throw this term around. They, it's also it's IPM. IPM. Yeah, IPM. Yeah. And, and what does it mean? Uh, integrated pest management. What's the definition? Oh, it's it's basically it's a process to uh, eliminate pests with as little risk to the environment or humans. I think. That's right. Which is kind of why I said the word organic at first, because it's like a very irresponsible, large-scale, conventional farm, like the top type that like crop dusts, right? Probably isn't using the word, isn't probably doing any integrated. Well, no, I, I think if it saves on money, they would be. But anyway. Okay, fine. I think so in the home, in the garden scale, it, like really a great example is like you go out in your garden and there's like, you notice there's a caterpillar on, you know, one of your plants. And instead of like going to your computer, going on there, ordering or organic pesticide, waiting for it to come, then getting a sprayer, and then going out there and spraying the pest, you just go and like take your thumb and finger and remove it. That would be an example of integrated pest management on a really small scale. So or basically what it is, it's like, yeah, it's not just identifying a bug and trying to kill it. It's thinking about the whole system. So, for example, are there host plants in my garden that are bringing more pests in? Are there host plants in my garden that are bringing in beneficial insects that will predatize my pest? Or is there a lot of debris around that's making my pest problem worse? Kind of like what a lot of people do to their properties with mosquitoes like instead of just letting the truck go by and spray malathion you're supposed to like empty the water and make sure that thing there's a lot of sunlight and that kind of it, that's like integrated pest management it's thinking about a bunch of things that you can do to control the pests including keep the plant healthy instead of just being like must eradicate pest with material yeah a thing that kills pests yeah. yeah, like a lot. Uh, the way that plays out on a lot of organic farms is um, exclusion or like a mechanical control with basically just covering the crop with uh, when the crop is most susceptible with some sort of insect netting. That's like really common, or just having a greenhouse itself with screening to keep the pest out. I mean, that's like kind of the you know the bug can't get in. So that's like that would be an example of integrated pest management, or oh yeah, the farmer's shadow. That's something you know, just just the idea like of the farmer being present and being observant. And we're gonna talk more about how to be more observant, but like that goes so far as just catching things early, actually being in your garden, um, because a lot can happen in a week out there. And so yeah. if you're not out there. We and... actually like, when we install gardens for beginners, we discourage automatic irrigation because we think that it's like really valuable to have, especially um, like a new system, a new garden and a new farmer like the person who bought it um, forced to go and stare at the garden every day like we think yes okay the ritual is watering like you must water the garden with a hose and so you must stand out there and you must get a little bored and thusly you must observe and in observing you can be like where did all the tips of my tomatoes go like without knowing that you're looking for pests you're visiting your garden every day and you're recognizing in a very quick way because it's daily like oh something looks different something feels different what is that new thing in my garden you know which is kind of like the first step of pest management is like even knowing that you have a pest. Yeah you're, you're being observant of the, of the ecology whether good or bad in your garden and, and, and I wouldn't like panic it's like oh my gosh there's a hole in one of my leaves you know that's not like like go deeper don't just be like what do I need to do like I'm gonna call Tiffany and ask her like what made this hole in my leaf instead like turn the leaf over look on the other side well that goes into pest scouting okay oh. so look we're talking about observation um, the term for observing your garden and 
figuring out if you have pests or not, like the official term is scouting. And you can Google that and there's like protocol. There are people whose jobs it is, people with science master's degrees who are pest scouts and they'll work for a really big farm or they'll work for a nursery and they'll be like pest scouts. And it's like very formalized, very scientific method based. But you can take that into the garden on a smaller scale. You basically, it encourages you, scouting is like observing in a very interactive and thoughtful way with your plants and all of their surroundings. So instead of, yeah, being like, oh my God, what do I do? I'm gonna take a picture and send it to Tiffany. There's a hole in my leaf. You look at the, you know, you, you go, oh, there's a hole in my leaf. And you look at the underside of the leaf and you look at the other plants around it and you inspect the soil and you inspect the debris and you inspect the grass uh, we're not there yet other <laughs> plants but yeah debris like oh next to the hole there are some dots what are the dots you know maybe at first you think they're eggs maybe you interact with them you smoosh <laughs> them you know like you have to you have to have fun with it get a piece of paper and a pen and almost like a creative writing exercise or something you need to like figure out the proper way to identify not the pest but what's going on so that you can use the internet or a book mm -hmm. to determine your own pest issue mm -hmm. um, I complain a little bit about people who send us pictures of really common pests because I really feel like it's important for people who garden to take control of their own pest issues and sort of like, kind of like, instead of making it my, my issue, what is this, by texting me, what is this pest? That's what you're doing, you're making it my problem. I think it's very good for a gardener to be empowered to make keep it and figure it out themselves. And I've noticed that people, they are like, oh, I can't Google it because I don't know what to look for, for example. But I'll, I kind of wanted to like give you a really obvious example, like, okay, maybe there's a pest on your kale. Um, you just noticed it but there are a lot of them and you're like what are these green dots on my kale okay so yeah you don't know what they are so you're like you're like I don't know what to Google why is she telling me to Google okay well if you kind of slow down and you find like really descriptive ways to the green dot right like is the green dot big or is it small okay well I call a big pest like a roach you know and I would call a and so then these dots on your kale, like they're really, really, really tiny and there are thousands or millions of them, right? So they're small or they are tiny. You could Google tiny green dots under my kale leaf, right? They're on the, like these are all descriptives. Like you went out, you were like, what plant is it on? Kale. Where are they? They're on the underside. What do they look like? They're green and they're tiny. And if you type that into Google, you are going to get like a thousand responses and they're all going to be their aphids. What's my Google trick? I don't know. Oh, I always write IFIS. Oh, uh, yeah. I F we talked about this last IFIS. week. But I, okay. I, yeah, so, so I'm like Googling, you know, holes in my kale leaf IFIS. And so then I'm, I'm it, it can be any extension, but basically that's just a kind of a way to like get through all the crappy gardening websites out there and like usually get to an extension entomology you know page that actually has mm -hmm. some good information then you can, then you'll probably find like a bunch of other pests that are in your on your region or wherever right and you'll be like bookmark like oh i didn't like, know yeah you know, just sort of yeah. ifis is again it's our um university of florida's agricultural department and they have an office in every county and they also have a pest identification email Okay, where if you do feel like you need help after using the internet responsibly, you can email them a picture, but they're also gonna want like a description, a clear picture taken during the day. I see like so many pictures of pests taken at night and I know 
otherwise, because people work during the day, but that's like never going to cut it. And Although it is good to go looking for your pests at night. Right, okay, that's different. But pictures during the day and clear and close up. IFAS is going to want that too because they want to tell you the right thing and they need the data. Just like you need the data to go on Google and be like, what is wrong with my pest? So if you need help figuring out like even which descriptive terms are useful, you can Google the term pest scouting. And there are even sheets, PDFs that you can download that people fill out when that's their job, you know? And it'll be like bug size, bug color, bug habitat, bug, you know, area, whatever, like plant mm -hmm. family. And all of that stuff is um, like really useful for either sending to the person that's going to diagnose for you or again, pests are the most interneted about gardening thing, I think. Mm -hmm. So like... There is information out there about every single pest. Yeah. Like, for sure. You know, especially identification confirmation, which yeah. is what a lot of people are looking for, well, you know. While we're here, also, I, I, there's, I mean, we're, we're sort of harping on insects a little bit here, but I think for a lot, for a lot of reasons, like bacterial and fungal issues are actually way more devastating. Um, and so, once again, you gotta, you're gonna have to use your, your big words, you know, and like, talk about you know if there's a yellow spot is it on the edge of your leaf is it between the veins of the leaf has the material and in the inside of it fallen out is it more gray and, or blue like like talk about the colors is there oh, yeah. like a is little it, rim are there old leaves dying or yeah. is it on the new growth Dude, there's so much and so it's like you really gotta like no there's yellow spots on the leaf like no like that's like not good not enough, enough. Like, like is yeah. there a brown circle around the yellow spot or a blue circle like is it perfectly round or is it angular and this is the fun thing a lot of these things have really descriptive names like my oh, leaf yeah. is really angular there's a thing called angular leaf spot like it looks like specks well there's something called bacterial speck you know so it's, um, there's a virus you know where it makes the the tomato leaves like all yellow and curly it's called tomato leaf curl yellow tomato leaf curl or whatever so yeah they're they're boring names but it yeah using your words in, in the search bar I also want to say there that a lot of people send us pictures of plants that have died clearly from like a bacterial or a fungal issue and they think they dried up. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Plants very rarely just dry up. But you yeah. don't see a pest and if you're a new gardener you're like, okay, my yeah. whole plant turned brown, I kept watering it and watering it, what happened, it dried up. And I just want to throw it out there that that doesn't really happen that often at all. Mm -hmm. Plants just drying up. It's usually like a bacterial or a fungal or a virus, more likely a fungus actually. And then you make the fungus worse because you think your plant is drying up. So you go and you overwater it more and you make it worse. But by that point, your plant's You're, screwed. It's a toast. <laughs> it's a but I think it's important to learn from those mistakes to be like, yeah. no, your plant didn't just dry up. You don't need to water them more you had a fungal problem because also if you plant the same plant in the same spot next year you'll have another fungal problem not necessarily uh, okay not you're fun. supposed to rotate the crops for the pests okay that's so, another part of integrated pest management proper rotation well there's a lot of cultural practices yeah. like right fertilizer you know mm -hmm. where were we you know, oh okay and if you if you're examining your pest and you don't see anything like Chris was saying it's really cool to go and look at your um, but your plants at nighttime if you have holes or something and you don't know what's um, making them you need to visit your plants or your garden multiple times throughout the day or night because there are a lot of um, like pests that will come out at night like yeah. snails and slugs are nighttime feeders and also, a lot of moths and stuff will lay their eggs on your plants at night when you're not around. And who else is at nighttime? What's that um, caterpillar that like drops off, like it pretends it dies and it goes into your soil at night when you're not around? Well, it's like a big one and it lives in the soil. Cutworms. The cutworms yeah. like... Um, oh, they're jerks. They like, we'll, we'll plant out like a row of little seedlings at the, at the farm and like if... if 
if that soil that we've sort of made into a bed is like too fresh, i.e. there was like other plants there like pretty recently, those cutworms, they just, they can like move around in the soil and they just come up and they'll just like mow the little broccoli plants. That's why they call them cutworms. Right, just, but then in the, when you go back to the farm the next day, there's nothing there. Yeah, but there's worse pests than cutworms out there. For yeah. Sure. So look, there's, I saw a comment that's like, I'd really like to see pests on your Instagram. They don't need to be on our Instagram. They're all over the internet. Like, that's sort of what I'm trying to say. Like, there's so many pest resources online. Um, like, and we usually it's kind of a waste. Like, there are just so many resources online for pests. Like, and really, really trustworthy ones. Like, uh, Chris was saying University of Florida, but um, like, you were on the iPad looking at like, Texas A&M, oh, like a really good thorough pest management. Cornell, Clemson. And a lot of them for tomatoes, especially for all the like funguses and bacteria on tomatoes, there are crazy thorough mm -hmm. diagnostic images where they're taking like oh, that's really tomato close up. MD. Tomato, yeah, Tomato MD is a website that has like every one of them. But also, I want to say that for a lot of these issues, there often isn't a. Um, really great solution you probably don't want to hear that but once your tomato plant has exhibited enough viral damage from pick a virus uh, I don't know tomato spotted wilt virus okay tomato spotted wilt um, it's that you can't do anything about it so yeah your plant is gone it's the same it's the same with a lot of the funguses Funguses, remember, like the thing that you can see to diagnose the fungus is the flowering body, like a mushroom. It's the flowering body. The fungus actually lives underground in your mulch or in your soil. Or on the leaf or in the leaf. Or... Well, I'm just, I'm giving mushroom as an oh, example. Oh, mushroom, yeah. Okay, but if it's on your leaf, once you see it, it's already so populated in your plant that it's yeah. flowering. Lame, I know, but... It means that you need to kind of like take in that information. I have basil downy mildew, right? Is that the really common basil one? Okay. Yeah. The, the one, it, its flowering body is, um, the flowering body is like uh, black dust under the leaf, and it's the most common killer of um, basil, like in forever. Um, you you're kind of like you need to say to yourself i have this pest issue what caused it you know what i mean like if you can't save the tomato or you can't save the basil you need to kind of take that information in and be like something in my garden caused this what could it be could it be like for a fungus that my plant was being overhead watered too much you know which when you think about it funguses really like damp, moist, dark, continuously wet surroundings. So usually when people tell me, hey, my cucumber has powdery mildew or whatever, instead of being like, treat the heck out of your powdery mildew, I'm kind of like, reconsider where your cucumber is first. And if you try it again somewhere else, yeah. you know, let's see what happens with the plant there. Um, because a lot of these pest things, again, it's not as simple as treat the thing a bunch of times and get your plant through it, you know? Because a lot of these pest issues are symptoms that something else is wrong. That's my go-to response also about leaf miners. I brought a picture of a leaf miner. I mean, I brought a picture. I brought a plant. Look, you see that squiggly line and that dot? This is two different types of leaf miner on a sweet potato. Um, basil leaf miners are basically like a little circle. Radial leaf miner. Radial leaf miner. Yeah, it's like a like... circle of damage with a brown dot in the center. Um, that or the squiggly line. Like if squiggly line leaf miners take over your tomato plant, for example. People have sent me some pictures of some pretty rough leaf miner situations. Leaf miner um, doesn't inherently damage your plant, and so it's a symptom. 
that something else is wrong with your plant and it was growing so slowly and so unhealthily that a non-problematic low impact pest has completely taken over the plant you know so it's like it's not about treating the leaf miner and making it so that your leaves are clean it's about finding bigger problems and finding solutions to those bigger problems like is your plant getting enough nutrients is your plant getting the proper amount of water is it getting the proper amount of sun yeah on that leaf miner one i'm gonna go ahead and say shade it does seem like leaf miners are always more in the shady gardens mm -hmm. like basil and and the tomatoes they seem like they get it worse are we gonna go into the greatest hits of pests already or no um are we gonna talk more about do you want to say something else? You wrote mites rule everything around me and what are the ants doing? Oh yeah, those are good. <laughs> mites, mites do rule everything around you in a way. Um, there are arachnids, right? And they're microscopic and they live in our skin and they, they kind of live on everything. And so a, a lot of our garden problems, especially when the plants start to get stressed either by heat or like this time of year, there's sort of mites making little white dots on everything or they might get on your peppers. And you can't see them, but they have symptomatic. Uh, but why aren't you? Why are we talking about mites now? Okay. Do you have something bigger to say about mites? No, no. We can we can move okay. on. Okay. What about ants rule? What are the ants doing? We're gonna come back to that one okay. too. Yeah. Sorry. Random notes. Okay. So we're gonna go through. I think like the best way to do this is like to get there into are the, so many pests. We gotta get into the weeds. We gotta get into the weeds. We gotta go pest by pest and identify and tell you how to identify them and how to treat them. And we're also going to talk about good critters in your garden because some of the ways to treat those pests is by making habitat and IPM. inviting the good bugs into the garden mm -hmm. to live there too. Yeah. And people will often do things like, help, how do I keep lizards out of my garden? And I'm like, no, wrong. Lizards are so good. And they're so cool. And they have so much personality. Yeah. They eat a lot of pests. Or like so, when, when farms get like actually get grants in order to put in pollinator beneficial strips. You know, like the, the USDA actually pays for that. So that's an example of integrated pest management and good bugs. And say, instead of spraying for these things, let's bring in the... Uh, the ecology that we need in order to, to balance things out. Okay. Okay, so look, greatest hits of pests. We already sort of talked about aphids as my example. Aphids are the number one kind of like easiest pest to um, identify and they're really, really common. This time of year, your brassicas, that's your kale, broccoli, radish, whatever family, leafy green family um, they're getting stressed out because it's hot and so all, okay so Chris ripped this out of our garden yeah I, I found this kale does anyone else's kale look like this yes so we kind of forgot about this one it's got okay. holes oh yeah there's so much wrong with this it's, it's covered in aphids so I don't know if we can get yeah I'm gonna enough. get a piece off it's like look hold on. oh yeah that's you see not how gross sellable. it is in there we can't sell that kale Okay, all those dots, whether they're black or green or clear yeah, or there's, white. There's so much going on there's here. There's so much going on on this. There's okay. parasitized There's more. parasitized, yeah. Okay, so look, tell there's them so about. This, okay, so yeah, okay. so under this leaf that's completely covered in, well, not completely covered. These, most of the aphids are, are gone. Um, so what's left are these little like parasitized, uh, carcasses that they're like little golden balls i'm sure you if anyone's had a really bad aphid infestation they've seen those yeah, the little balls. tree amigos posted about them i kind of extensively recently so that's a good read um there's also a lot of like little shedded skins because a lot of these mm -hmm. these insects they go through like six or seven stages so they leave behind like all these little exoskeletons which is kind of fun um yeah, so I mean this aphid infestation is, oh, and they're born pregnant, so there's some new ones oh. here, you know. Also, this this leaf has a lot of um, like black residue on it, and that is sooty mold, right? Uh, sooty sure, mold? yeah. Okay, so aphids 
poop out this stuff called honeydew. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Ants, like the ants are in the little bar and they're like drinking a thing that looks like a snail, but it's an aphid and they're like drinking its butt. <laughs> and that's like a cartoonized version of what's happening here. Ants will farm aphids like cow, like we farm cows. They'll pick up aphids from the soil and they'll carry them on to plants that they know aphids like and they'll leave them there and then they'll go home and then they'll come back and they'll harvest their honeydew. And too much honeydew also brings in stuff like sooty mold, which is on the interior of here. And so for example, if you've ever had like a tree full of aphids and then there's like this black dust too, they yeah, go like together. Under, under the palms. Under the palms, uh, yeah, it's gross. Can but, I tell an aphid story real quick? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, one, at the farm, and I noticed this in Homestead, we have a lot of fire ants down there. Um, and so it always, it's always like kind of a combination of things. So usually like, usually it'll start with like a hole in my drip line. And so like a certain number of plants will get overwatered. But then it just so happens that like some fire ants will set up shop nearby and they'll go a little further and the, 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 the fire ants will come and they'll actually girdle, girdle the plant. So that means they'll like, they'll use their little mouths and they'll, they'll, they'll pick out the weak plants that are getting overwatered and they'll make them even weaker. Mm. And so then they, they start, they, they nibble around the edge and so like basically the plant like wilts in the heat of the day. Wilting makes the cell wall softer. Guess what's all over the leaves? Aphid. So the, the, the ants have literally weakened the plant in order to make it support more aphids. The plants that are over next to it that are really healthy, no aphids, no ants, no problem. It was just where that little irrigation leak was. The ants came in, took advantage of the situation, and they're farming their aphids. And I can't, can't really, you know. So yeah, look, if you see that you have aphids, um, like if you can see your pest and you're like, okay, I want to treat this, I want to try and save my plant, you kind of have to make that decision. Like, is the plant savable based on your observations, based on where it is in the season? Like maybe it's at the end of the season and so you feel okay um, like giving up on it, but maybe it's the beginning of the season and the plant is young and the aphids aren't that bad. What you can do, the best thing you can do is reduce their populations manually. What I mean when I say that, which people are always like, oh my God, duh, when I mention it, is like find the really, really infested leaves and cut them off and put them in your garbage. I know I don't like turning plants into garbage either, but if you put them in your compost and you're not a really pro composter and it doesn't get like to a certain temperature, then they'll just live in there. So you don't want to like, just make your problem like a cyclical one by having them either like leave the compost while they're still alive or stay dormant in the compost. You you need to make sure that your compost gets hot enough to cook them and a lot of people don't so you're safer throwing them away into the garbage. But if you go and you remove like let's say your oldest eight kale leaves then you've reduced your pest population in like with no extra tools and no chemicals, even organic ones, by like 80%, just like that, you know? And then you can go and treat the rest of your plant with um, an, an, an organic pesticide. And I guess like we should start introducing organic pesticides. Um, just like with organic fertilizer, they're, um, they're regulated by a, a certifying body called OMRI, O-M-R-I. This is the logo down here, you see OMRI. So if you're shopping online for uh, pest management stuff, like you've diagnosed your pest and you've gone to somewhere reputable to ask like, how do I treat it? Um, make sure that whatever they're telling you to buy is OMRI listed. We don't use anything that isn't OMRI on any of our plants. Um, Neem is like a very common go-to for most soft and hard bodied uh, garden insects, garden pests. Um, you mix it with water, it's an oil, and you mix it with water and you add like just a dash of like a Dr. Bronner's, like a dish soap kind of thing. And I see that going wrong a lot on the internet 
people are like, I sprayed my plant with, with dish soap, what do I do next? And it's like they're forgetting the most important part, which is the neem oil. The dish soap is there to... Surfactant. Sur as a surfactant. It's there to make it so that the oil separates and is taken and made into a lot of different pieces and then mixes with the water. Because if you pour oil into water without a surfactant, then all you're doing is spraying some of your plants whoops, with a ton of oil. Yeah. And then you're playing, spraying most of your plants with water. Your home but the, 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 the soap does coat the little aphid bodies if we're still sort of specifically talking about aphids. But then the neem will sort of make the plant taste worse. And then um, a lot of people use a spray bottle for pest management. And I really encourage you guys to consider buying one of these. This is a one gallon pump aerosoler thing that you can buy at Home Depot or online and it's $15. And, and they're, all, they're all junk. And they're all junk, but they'll last <laughs> at least two seasons. And you need to make, you need to make treating your pests easy or you're not gonna do it. So that's like a key, we know that. We know that humans, for example, like if you have a really crappy hose that's really heavy and it gets kinked every time you roll it up, you are gonna dread watering your garden, right? So you need to get yourself a new hose so that you like watering your garden. If you are treating your pests with like a Windex, like a spray bottle, you that is crazy. Even if you have a small garden, this you fill up, you don't have to fill it all the way, you can do less, and you pump it a few times, and then you get like this really beautiful spray with just, by just doing this, you know? Instead of being like finger workout and trying to get a thorough spray with the finger workout because you'll never get a thorough spray that way. So we use, um, we also have really big versions of this. Like this is a home garden one that I wanted to show you guys, but we have a backpack that does three gallons and Chris has a backpack that is gas powered. Oh yeah. And Game he pulled, changer. oh my God. And he just holds these two wands out like on either hand and it's like, <laughs> and like it, <laughs> And it like shoots his whole uh, farm, and then you know they go all the way up to like crop duster. Yeah. But this is the one that you want to have for yeah, your Yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna spray, don't even spray unless you're gonna do a good job at it. Yeah. You know? Don't so, do it. It's not worth like, it. Be if you're just, yeah, like it's if you're just gonna like try to spritz the top of the plant, like like don't even bother. Like you need to really. I mean, it depends what the pest is. If the pest like is just like say it's a cucumber and it's just like worms that are at the top at the growing tips, focus on the growing tips. You know, it, and if it's aphids and the underside of the leaves, go on the undersides of the leaves. You know, and if you don't get the undersides of the leaves, you're not doing anything. Not doing it. Yeah. So. Oh, that's uh, my timer for starting it again. Oh. Okay, so look, because of the um, the way Instagram Live works, we have to stop this one and just start a new one to keep talking. So. We're gonna stop Instagram living, and then like in 30 seconds, we're gonna start again. And so we hope you guys um, join us because we have like 20 more pests to talk about. And we wanna like make sure, we're gonna show you guys a bunch of them. Like we're gonna we have a lot, just jump, lot of into, more material jump into the garden and be like, this is a this pest, this is a this pest, which is like, I think what everybody, they really wanna see the pests and they really wanna see the things that we 